Well, we are back in the Gospel of Luke this morning, and because we have a, a lot to cover today on, on shortened time, let's get right into our text. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verses 46, and we will ambitiously try to get all the way through verse 56. Uh, these are the words of Mary, the mother of our Lord, in response to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, as they greeted each other there in the hill country of Judah. And because they have been included in the canon of Scripture, these are the words of the living God. God's word reads, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has looked upon the humble state of his slave, for behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. What I've just read for you is what has historically been called Mary's Magnificat. The word Magnificat is Latin for that word you see there where Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Now, sadly, as with all scripture, through the years, there have been those who have absolutely butchered the meaning of Mary's words in the text we'll be covering today. For instance, according to Pope John Paul II, Uh, Mary's words here serve as a model for those who do not passively accept the adverse circumstances of personal and social life. In other words, Mary was raging against the machine before it was cool to do so. Uh, Then there's Courtney Hall Lee, who is a black liberation theologian, author of a book titled The Black Madonna, who writes, Mary's Magnificat serves as an anthem for black women declaring personal blessedness and worth along with intimate knowledge of God's preference for the oppressed. In the tradition of the spirituals sung by Harriet Tubman as she liberated the enslaved and the freedom songs of the 60s that were the backdrop of the civil rights movement, the Magnificat is a freedom song. Then there's the feminist theologian named Laura Jean Truman, who in her bio refers to herself as an amateur mystic who lives and writes in the in-between places of queerness and loving Jesus. She says, Mary sings a song of justice for the whole world making a way for us to understand ourselves as women who are called to preach and write and pastor and protest and lead. Mary tells us that whatever we're called to do and be for the world, whether it's mother, teacher, president, dancer, social worker, CEO, pastor, preacher, we can do and be for all people. And according to abortion advocate and seminary student, Andrea Corso Johnson, our current our nation's current abortion laws, meaning any governmental directive which restricts a woman's so-called right to kill the child she's carrying in her womb, is rooted in what she calls ironclad intersectional structure of domination. And then she goes on to note, this structure seems set on an end game of restrictive reproductive conformity. And Mary's Magnificat calls us to break from the confines of these structures and to recreate frameworks where access agency and autonomy become cornerstones. In case you didn't catch it on that first read there, she's actually making the argument that Mary, who in context was rejoicing over the child she was carrying in her womb, would be in support of a woman's so-called right to end the life of the child she's carrying in her womb. Well, I'm sorry to say that each of the individuals I've just quoted wasted a lot of time and research and paper and frankly air in taking those positions, because each of the 11 verses we're going to be covering today show us clearly that this passage is not about pushing back on the hand that we've been dealt or taking the power back. It's not about race relations in America or uh, women's liberation or the so-called right to abortion. This passage isn't even ultimately about Mary. Rather, it's about God. Now, pronouns in our day are kind of a big deal. Have you noticed that? The whole kind of cult of pronouns? People identify themselves now. It has to be he, him, or she, her, or ziz, zem, zer, a, m, per, or per self, meow. I better not go in the transcript later. 
I'll play the pronoun game for just a minute, okay? As we quickly scan our text here in verses 46 through 56, note what you see. And if you have an NAS or an LSB, you see it, it's all capitalized. Everything here is about he, his, 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 him, he, his. And then I see about four he's, and then I see his and his and he. Where do the pronouns point? They point to God. Yes, historically, it has been called Mary's Magnificat, but ultimately this section of scripture, which captures this godly young woman's rejoicing and praise, is all about God and giving praise to God. Back to our text, we're going to see here from Mary this, this spirit-wrought outburst of praise. And as she does so in this beautiful passage of scripture, she is going to rattle off, are you ready for this, 15 truths about the living God. 15 truths about the God she worshiped, who is the very same God that you and I worship right here and right now. And and one more preliminary, as we work our way through this text, I want us to notice something uh, in particular here. I want you to pay extra notice to something. Notice how familiar with the scriptures and how committed to the scriptures Mary was. This woman's words, these righteous reflections are, are totally saturated with scripture and Old Testament concepts and Old Testament phrases. So though Mary was young in years and though she was shallow in her experiences, it was obvious that even at this young age, she was this deep well of knowledge of scripture. This wasn't a young woman who who choked down a couple of verses each morning like we choked down a a couple Tylenol with a cup of coffee. No, she was immersed in scripture. This this is heartfelt language of praise that indicate that, that Mary read her Bible. And and not just read her Bible, but soaked herself and marinated herself in God's word. So much so that when it came to this point in her life, that that point of praising God for the great favor he had shown her and granting her that great privilege of carrying the Savior, what came out of her were not these trite phrases or stale expressions or hallmark card level words of theology. No, what came out was scripture and, and deep awareness and familiarity with scripture. Charles Spurgeon once famously said about John Bunyan, who I mentioned last week, he says, why this man, speaking of Bunyan, is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere, his blood is bibbling. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. Well, long before Spurgeon and, and, and long before Bunyan, there, there was Mary, who evidently delighted in the scripture. The the word of God was coursing through her veins, and it came out in this praise of the God of that word. Now, if we, like Mary, are Bible people, if we know our Bibles, we know that Mary's words here in Luke 1 have certain parallels to the words of of praise and prayer offered by another faithful woman, and an expectant mother, in fact, whose name was Hannah. Turn with me, if you you would, in your Bibles to 1 Samuel Back in the Old Testament, after the Pentateuch, ending with Deuteronomy of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then you have 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, and we'll pick it up in 1 Samuel 2. The first couple chapters of 1 Samuel, as you're turning there, are the account of of Hannah, who would be the mother of of Samuel. And after Samuel, Hannah's long prayed for child was born, she prayed these words, In 1 Samuel 2, starting in verse 1, it says, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I am glad in your salvation. There is no one holy like Yahweh. Indeed, there is no one besides you. There is no other rock like our God. Do not multiply speaking so very proudly. Let arrogance not come out of your mouth, for Yahweh is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but those who stumble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. Yahweh puts to death and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Yahweh makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He exalts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's. And he set the world on them. 
He keeps the feet of his holy ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness, for not by power shall a man prevail. Those who contend with Yahweh will be dismayed. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. Yahweh will render justice to the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. It's a beautiful, rich prayer concerning and containing rich and beautiful truths about the God who had gifted Hannah and her husband Elkanah with, with a son. And, and Hannah's prayer does have some obvious parallels as we go back to, to Luke 1 with Mary's words, so much so that certain commentators have called Hannah's prayer the, the Old Testament twin of Mary's Magnificat. So what are we to make of that? Was, was Mary intentionally trying to channel her inner Hannah as she prayed? Was Hannah a type of Mary or was Samuel a type of Christ? I really don't think we have to go down those avenues. And th instead, I think a more plausible explanation for the connection between these two outbursts of praise, between Hannah and Mary, and one by Hannah and then one several hundred laters, years later by Mary, goes back to what I mentioned earlier, which is that Mary was a student of and was saturated with God's word. Her, her praise rested upon the foundation of God's perfect word. She was this devout Jewish girl. She had been taught the sacred writings, as, as Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3.15. It was natural for Mary in, in this special moment of joy, having been taught to express her joy, to express her exaltation in biblical language, which naturally took her to Hannah's prayer, which was this parallel circumstance. But, but note, it wasn't only Hannah's prayer to which the Spirit of God directed Mary. No, as we're about to see, as, as she praised God for who he is and what he has done, she wove in this, this wide-ranging mosaic of, of Old Testament quotations and ideas and concepts and allusions. And as she did so, she showed us and, and showed all, the whole world who reads this that, that she rightly viewed God not merely as a pile of, of assorted attributes, not as a philosophical construct, not as some sort of metaphysical abstraction, no, simple, young Jewish girl that she was, she was childlike in her faith. She had the kind of childlike faith that we're, we're each called to have. She wasn't unburdened by what has been, rather she was steered and guided by what actually is and what actually is true of God. She viewed God rightly in terms of his everyday actions and his tangible faithfulness to his promises. And she filtered all of it all that she had seen, all that she had experienced through her understanding of what God had revealed about himself in his word. With that, let's dive back into our text. It starts in verse 46. Very simply, it says, and Mary said, and Mary said, Mary here is responding to what Elizabeth said back in verses 42 through 45, where we were last time, where Elizabeth says, this is midway through verse 42, blessed are you. She's speaking to Mary there. This is that extended greeting on the front porch of the house there in the hills, uh, uh, the hill country. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And, and how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. So in response to those words, those triple words of blessing from Elizabeth, blessed are you and blessed is she and blessed is the fruit of your, wor your womb, that, that Mary then responded in our text with this outburst of praise. And she begins with these words. You see them there at the beginning of verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord. That's the first of the 15 truths we're going to see here this morning about God from these words of praise. And that is our first truth, that he is, God is, worthy of praise. That that word magnifies, from the Greek verb megaluno, means to make great, to, to praise, to extol. That, that's what Mary was doing here. She was praising her God, glorifying her Lord, extolling his name. Rather than shining the light on herself, you know, look at me, I'm going to be the mother of the Messiah. Instead, she turned the spotlight on her heavenly father. She was making much of him, not of herself. She was like David in Psalm 145, verse 3, who says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. She was, she was making sure his great name was proclaimed, not, not her own. 
And in doing so, she was drawing from various Old Testament scriptures. We're going to see this throughout the message this morning. Like Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Or Psalm 69, 30. I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. That's what she was doing here, magnifying the Lord because he is worthy of praise. Continuing on, we see in verse 47, she says, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Now note, she began by saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. And the very next thing she says is, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Now, if you've done any reading in systematic theology, you get into the topic of biblical anthropology, which is the doctrine of man, and you'll find those who maintain that, that we as human beings are threefold in our essence. It's called the trichotomist view. The idea is that we are body and we are soul and we are spirit. That's in contrast to the dichotomist view, which says that we are twofold in our essence. There's the, the physical component, the material component, the hair and the fingernails and the toes and those sorts of things. And then there's the non-physical component, which could be called either the soul or the spirit. Those who are in the trichotomist camp who say that we're threefold, they'll point to a passage like here and they'll say, look, Mary is saying that, that soul and spirit were different components of her essence. Her soul and her spirit were distinct components of who she was. But is that what Mary, this young Jewish girl in this context, was actually saying? As she stood there, sat there in, in stunned and, and worshipful praise, was she attempting to, di to develop a, a robust trichotomist theology that the Bavinks and the Burkhoffs of the world would, would debate many centuries later? I don't think so. Rather, by using these words, soul and spirit, what she's doing, consistent with what she's doing throughout this text, is drawing on various different Old Testament authors who had gone before her by using those words soul and spirit interchangeably to describe the inner man, the core of one's essence and being. Places like Psalm 77, verse 2, it says, In the day of my distress I sought the Lord. In the night my hand was stretched out without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted, I remember God and I am disturbed. I muse and my spirit faints. The words are used interchangeably. Or Isaiah 26, 9 says, At night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you earnestly. That's what's happening here with Mary. She's saying here that in the depths of her being, she's magnifying the Lord. In the depths of her being, she's rejoicing in God, her Savior. So back to our text, verse 47, what I'm saying from here is that what Mary was doing here was not trying to split theological hairs over the distinction between soul and spirit. Rather, she was praising and was rejoicing. She says, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. And that's our second truth here about God this morning is that, that he is the Savior. Note the language. It's it's so clear, it's so unavoidable. Mary referred to God as my savior. She wasn't sinless, she wasn't immaculate. She didn't claim to be sinless, she didn't claim to be immaculate. No, as her own divinely inspired words here reveal, she saw herself as needing deliverance. She felt her own need for divine grace. She, she understood her need for salvation. And her words are reminiscent of various other Old Testament authors that she would have been familiar with. Like Psalm 25, 5, lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. Isaiah 12, 2 says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not dread. Micah 7, 7 says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for Yahweh. I will wait for the God of my salvation. It was passages like these that young Mary had in mind when she said here in verse 47, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. She knew that God, that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of heaven and earth was her Savior. And we know that to be true in our day too, do we not? That's what we heard in the waters of baptism just now. We know that this very God is the God of salvation today in the church age. It's found in places like 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. 
Or Titus 3, verse 4 says, But when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The point is, Mary clearly didn't view herself as one who was worthy of adoration or praise and certainly not worship. No, she knew that she needed a savior. And she knew the true God, the living God, as her savior. And that caused her, we see here, verse 47, to rejoice. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. In her soul, in her spirit, in her innermost being, Mary was praising and magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in him as her savior. We think about David back in his Psalm of Repentance, Psalm 51, and he prays to God, restore to me the what? The joy of my salvation. Mary here didn't need to have her joy in her salvation restored. Her joy, we see it on the page there, was already there. And that joy was only amplified by the fact by that, that the child that she was now carrying in her womb, we saw back in verse 31, would be named Jesus, Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. And this child that she was carrying in her womb would be the savior of the world. He would, he would save his people from their sins. That's exactly, by the way, what the angel Gabriel said to her betrothed, Joseph, over in the Gospel of Matthew, in, in Matthew 1.21. Gabriel makes this separate appearance to Joseph and talks about the type of salvation that Mary's son, Jesus, would bring. He says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Think about that. Mary's sin, like your sin and my sin and AJ's sin and, and Greg's sin, would ultimately be forgiven by God through the very infant that was then being formed by the Holy Spirit in her own virgin womb. The sheer thought of it all led Mary to say that her spirit there, verse 47, was now rejoicing in God, her Savior. Moving on, the next truth that we see about God in this outburst of praise, number three, is that he is meticulously sovereign. He's meticulously sovereign. Verse 48 says, for he has looked upon the humble state of his slave. The verbal idea there that he has looked upon, that, that's referring to God's loving care of all that he's seeing, of all that's in his sight. He is meticulously sovereign over it all. And he was meticulously sovereign in selecting Mary to be the bearer of the Son of God in her womb. Hannah used a very similar expression in, in 1 Samuel 111, where she spoke of, of Yahweh of hosts looking on the affliction, her affliction, as she anticipated the son that she was praying for. Here in Luke, with, with God as the reference, those, those words he has looked upon, verse 48, are referring to that event of, of Jesus' conception in Mary's womb. Now, we might look at the next few words where it says, for he has looked upon the humble state of his slave. We might see those words, humble state, and think that what Mary is doing there is a bit of spirit-approved humble bragging. You know, kind of like the old Moses, the, the sanctified statements of Moses that he's the, the most humble man on earth. Like, that, maybe that she's, that's what she's doing here. That's not, though, what humble state means there. Humble, humble state there means lowly. That, that's referring to her, her low estate, meaning she was one of the, the little people. She was on one of the lower rungs of society. She was of modest means. She would have been what we'd call a have-not, a, a nobody, just a young, ordinary Jewish girl from Nazareth. But we do know that Mary was, in fact, humble, not just lowly, but, but humble in terms of her, her posture before God. And we get that not from the words humble state, but rather what comes next, where she refers to herself as his slave, for he has looked upon the humble state of his slave. Note that Mary there doesn't identify herself as the queen of heaven. She doesn't call herself the blessed mother or the blessed virgin or the co-mediator between God and man. No, she refers to herself exactly as she thought of herself, a doule, a slave. Not exactly the type of person you and I might think of if we were running the world to take on such a significant responsibility as carrying the Christ, the Messiah, in her womb. But that is precisely 
the plan that God had for her. Though she was in this lowly position, she was loved by God. And and though she was a slave, she was a saved slave, and and God was going to use her mightily to advance his purposes. The whole thought of it reminds me of the the words Paul would later write many years later in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 28 and 29, when he says that, that God uses the base things of the world. It's the despised things that God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he might abolish the things that are, so that no flesh may boast before God. God had looked upon her. That's the idea here. God had chosen Mary, this, this otherwise obscure young Jewish girl who was betrothed to, the, betrothed to this carpenter named Joseph to be the one who would bear the Messiah in her womb. And so now, deeply conscious of the favor she'd been shown, very aware of the the goodness of of God's surprising grace, Mary was now rejoicingly praising God, her Savior. The next thing we glean about God here in this passage is that he is the provider of blessing. That's number four. He's the provider of blessing. Of blessing. Look at the second half of verse 48. She says, For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Now, the first half of what she says there, for behold, from this time on, that, that's a pretty simple expression saying that that change is coming, that, that things will, will never be the same. This, this pivotal point in history, human history, salvation history, has arrived with the coming of the Savior through her virgin womb. Jesus used very similar language, by the way, that, that, that idea of from this time on language in, in Luke 5.10. He, he calls James and John, the fishermen, to follow him. And he says, from now on, you will be catching men. Before you were catching fish, now, from now on, you're going to be catching men. Paul uses a similar expression in Acts chapter 18 when he's ministering in Corinth. And he eventually shakes out his garments as he's dealing with the Jewish people there. And he says, your blood be on your own heads. This is Acts 18, 6. I am clean. From now on, from this point on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's the idea here in in verse 48. Mary is saying that from this time on, starting with the conception of her son, the Messiah, things would be different. They would never be the same. And specifically, from this time on, she says, all generations will count me blessed. Now note what's not said there. Note that nothing is said there about Mary being the one who would confer blessings or give blessings or grant blessings. Rather, she would be the one who would be blessed. God had been gracious to to look upon her, his lowly servant, and she recognized herself as this grateful recipient of his grace. She was a model of faith, not an object of faith that she's made out to be in many circles today. Moving right along, the next thing Mary reveals about God here was his power, his omnipotence, his his might. That's our fifth heading, if you're tracking and keeping notes, that he is mighty. God is mighty. Look at the first part of verse 49. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Now, in the context here of of Luke's gospel, the fact that, that God is mighty, dunitas, powerful, the, the, the mighty one, that would have immediately recalled what, what the angel Gabriel revealed to Mary just a few verses up the page earlier in this account about God's power and might. We think of right where it says in verse 35 here, the angel answered her, answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And then just a couple of verses later, verse 37, he says, for nothing will be impossible with God. These are indicators of God's power, God's omnipotence. What what God had promised would happen, even if it seemed impossible to to human eyes, even if it sounded impossible or or irreconcilable with human biology, was always possible for Almighty God. This is the God who was described in these ways, Psalm 89, verse 6, for who in the sky is comparable to Yahweh? Who among the sons of the mighty is like Yahweh, a God greatly dreaded in the council of the holy ones? Or or Zephaniah 3.17 says, Yahweh, your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. God then is, is mighty. He is powerful. 
But note, he isn't passive in his power or passive in his might. He's not this inert cauldron that's sort of bubbling over of power that never does anything or never go, does anything with it. No, no, he acts upon his power. He acts upon his might. He acts upon his strength, which we see in verse 49, where she says that the mighty one has done great things for me. And that word great things or the word great there, megala, is in the plural, meaning it wasn't just the visit of this angel and it wasn't just the conception in her virgin womb which made up the catalog of the great things that Mary was praising God for. Also on that list would have been her birth and her lineage and her nationality and her life and breath and movement and her betrothal to Joseph. Those were all great things that the Lord had done for her. And of course, the cherry on top of it all would have been the great privilege which God had bestowed upon her by selecting her to become the mother of the Savior. And note this, there were, I think, only a third of the way through this, these words of praise. This is actually the last time we'll hear Mary refer to herself like, like in the first person. This is the last first person reference by Mary from here on out, which points to the fact that Mary really was a humble woman of God. She really did grasp the reality of who it is and who it was who was at center stage in all of these events. Certainly by now she recognized the significance of her role, but ultimately she realized it is what God had done and who God is that truly matters. That's what was filling her mind and, and informing her praise as she laid out all these, these righteous reflections. Now the, the next observation she made about the nature and the character of, of the God who had so supremely blessed her was this, that he is holy. He is holy. That's number six. You see it there at the end of verse 49, very simply, one sentence there, and holy is his name. It's connected to the previous sentence. She says, he's done great things for me, and holy is his name. And note that. Having recognized herself as this undeserving recipient of God's favor and blessing, having received this, this highest honor conceivable to women, an honor that would be forever remembered from generation to generation, there was with Mary not even this, this shadow of this attitude of self-righteousness in her words. There, there was no hint or indication here that she felt like, like she really deserved this high distinction that had come her way. No, she gave all praise and glory to God. And she recognized, as had been consistently testified to throughout the Old Testament scriptures, that God is holy, that he is the absolute definition and standard of moral perfection. And to say that God is holy is also to say that he is, he is set apart from his creation. He is separate. He is exalted. He is the sovereign and authoritative ruler over his entire creation. Mary recognized that. Mary also recognized that there is this impassable gulf between the holy God of heaven and sinful creatures like you and I. And she also recognized that, that not only is God holy, but his very name, as it says here, is holy. Meaning he is, in his essence, holy and perfect within himself. And therefore, he is to be treated with reverence and awe. This calls to mind a whole other catalog of Old Testament scriptures. Psalm 111, verse 9 says, holy and fearsome is his name. The one you're probably more familiar with is, is Isaiah 57, 15, which says, for thus says the one high and lifted up who dwells forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. And also with the crushed and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the crushed. So while Mary did recognize that creatures like her from generation to generation would call her blessed, she also did recognize rightly that she herself was just a creature. And to her and to all other creatures, including you and me today, as we gaze at God as, as how he has revealed himself about who he is in his word, all we can say, all we should say is holy is his name. Well, God is not only holy, the next thing we learn about God from Mary here is that he is, he is merciful. That's number seven. God is merciful. Look at verse 50 as we read on. This is her 
drawing from Psalm 103, 17. She says, and his mercy is upon generation after generation. With those words, Mary was turning from praising God for his holiness to praising him for his mercy. Though God in his holiness would be well within his rights to have long ago destroyed all that is not holy, everyone and everything that has ever existed on planet earth, though he could have long ago incinerated this planet overrun by rebels many centuries ago, though he could have wiped out every past generation of ungrateful sinners like you and I and our ancestors, the reality is he's not only holy, he's also merciful. And Mary knew that. And she knew that not only from experience, she knew that as a student of God's word. She knew that from scripture. She knew that God had repeatedly declared in his word that his was a love that was loyal and steadfast and patient and faithful. She certainly would have known the words of Exodus 34, where God reveals himself as being one who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. We all like that part, by the way, but what comes next is, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. But Mary knew that truth. She she knew the words of Psalm 103, 8 through 10, which are encapsulated here, where she says, Yahweh is, the psalmist says, Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always contend with us and he will not keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins and he has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. So she knew those biblical truths. She also knew that there were many generations between her generation and the days of Moses and the Exodus. And there were many generations between hers and the generation of King David and and King Solomon and the divided kingdom after that. And, And she knew that in those intervening generations, Countless Israelites like her had experienced the goodness of God's patient and merciful hand. And she knew that there was no reason to boast in God's mercy, but only praise him for his mercy, which is what she did. Here's the next of her insights as it relates to the living God. This is number eight. He is to be feared. He is to be feared. Verse 50, after saying his mercy is upon generation after generation, she continues quoting Psalm 103, 17 by saying, toward those who fear him. God's favor, his his mercy, which had proceeded before Mary from generation to generation, which has proceeded since Mary, even to our day from generation to generation, was and always has been directed toward those who fear him. As the spirit moved her to declare these words, She again had Psalm 103, 17 in mind, which says, but the loving kindness of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. To those who truly fear him, fear God, meaning to revere him and honor him and respect him. To to those who seek to avoid that which is contrary to his will and to strive to do that which pleases him. In other words, to those who are truly his own and have truly believed upon his name, God is merciful. He is graciously faithful toward those who acknowledge him. And and his favor is specifically directed to those who seek him, meaning those who fear him. To those he shows mercy. Mary was such a person. She was such a worshiper. She was a a God-fearer. Now, she wasn't trembling in, in, in slavish fear. Rather, hers was a, a reverent, childlike fear. She acknowledged the, the holy, exalted position of her God. She understood that she was an undeserving recipient of his mercy, and here we see her very clearly praising him. Now, for the rest of what Mary says here, starting in verse 40, 51, excuse me, we're going to see her rattle off with the Spirit's direction a string of verbs that are all in the past tense. You see them there, starting in verse 51. He has done a mighty deed. He has scattered those who were proud. He has brought down rulers. He has filled the hungry. He has given help to Israel. 
And I bring that up because each of those verbs in Greek is in what is known as the aorist tense, which is usually used to, to point backwards to a specific point in history, an, an act that was performed or done at a, at a specific point in time. Now, now, some have taken these verbs to be pointing forward somehow prophetically, as though Mary is saying here in verses 51 and following that, that, that it's not so much about what God had done historically in Israel, but rather what God would do in the future in Israel. And I have to say, contextually and grammatically, I don't really buy the futuristic take on those few verses. I don't think that's what she's saying here. I don't think this is an instance, in other words, of Mary prophesying. Rather, this is her recounting and remembering certain historical facts that she had read about God in his word about things he had done in Israel. Now, of course, we know, sitting this side of the cross, that because God is always perfectly consistent with his character, that because he has done certain things consistent with his character historically, he will be consistent with that character into the future and will bring about certain promises that he showed faithfulness to in the past yet again in the future. But I don't think this specific text can be stretched to say that Mary here was futuristically prophesying about things to come. I think this is a, a past tense referent here. But with that, Here's the next characteristic of God that she highlights. It's beginning of verse 51 here, where he, this would be our, our heading. God is beyond human description. That's number, I'm losing count. <laughs> that is number nine. He is beyond human description. This is, these are the perils of preaching a 15-point message. He is beyond human description. Look what it says, verse 51. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. This is yet another one of those expressions that reveals how deeply familiar Mary was with the Old Testament scriptures. Through her study of scripture, largely the Psalms here, Mary would have seen God continually being described as having various human attributes, hands and eyes and ears and a finger and a face and a nose and nostrils and of course here an arm. Psalm 89.10 says, you scattered your enemies with your strong arm. Psalm 89.13 says, you have a mighty arm. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. All speaking of God. Isaiah 53.1 says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Now, does God have literal arms like, like you and I do? No, John 4.24 says, God is spirit. These are what are known as anthropomorphic expressions, meaning God has revealed himself as the eternal, infinite God to us humans in human language, accommodating language, limiting language, so that we can understand who he actually is to some degree. So what Mary was doing here then, as the Lord prompted her and moved her to give us these words, is what we all ultimately have to do in describing the infinite. She was using human language to, to describe the God of all. And by referring here to his arm, she is referring to his power, which can be used to deliver, to support, to uphold. His, his arm of power can be used to, to scatter and, and drag down and drive out. And his arm can bring about salvation, as it did in Mary's time, as it does in our time, even as we heard this morning in the waters of baptism. Here's our next one. He punishes the proud. He punishes the proud. Look at the next part of verse 51. It says, he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. The heart we know is, is the core of our inner being. And according to scripture, it's the, it's the control center which, which drives our emotions, our thoughts, our, our words, our deeds. And that's why Proverbs 4.23 says it so clearly, guard your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. The, the, the sin of pride, then, is not always just an act we commit. It's who we are at, at the heart level. That's what Proverbs 4 is getting after. And what Mary was rightly remembering here is that in the course of history, God had, in his might, in his power, with his strong arm, repeatedly punished those who were proud in heart, those who made much of themselves while making little of God. A passage would be Numbers 10.35, this is Moses, 
uh, the, the words of Moses, but it's also speaking of Moses. It says, then it happened when the ark set out that Moses said, rise up, O Yahweh, and let your enemies, those would be the proud of heart, be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Or we think of the words of Hannah's prayer, which we read earlier, 1 Samuel 2, 7 says, Yahweh makes poor and rich. He brings low, brings low would be those who were proud in heart. He brings them low. He also exalts. And then, of course, there would be passages that Mary wouldn't be familiar with because they weren't written yet. Christian scripture, like James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. God has always judged pride. He, was, he has always been opposed to the prideful, those who are proud, because pride fundamentally is the idolatrous worship of self, which obviously competes with where our affections and our worship are to go, namely God. So Mary here was praising God simply for being who he had always been, a God who exalts the humble of heart and who brings down the prideful. While we're on that topic, she continues the thought into verse 52, saying, he has brought down rulers from their thrones. Our next observation is that he humbles the exalted, and that goes with 52 here, he humbles the exalted. Namely, he humbles those who, who exercise authority as though they are the ultimate authority. He, he, he brings down those who wield power as though they have ultimate power. He, he brings them down. Their, their oppression, their tyranny, their lack of compassion will eventually be dealt with by the mighty arm of God. And again, Mary doesn't have American politics in mind. She doesn't have you know, Russian-Ukrainian politics in mind. She's thinking historically of the, the past rulers who had been brought down before her. She's thinking of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, who ate grass like an ox as a punishment for his pride. She's thinking of Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2, 7, where Yahweh makes poor and rich, he brings low, he also exalts. They're the words of Job in Job 12, 21, he pours contempt on nobles. As of Mary's day, in other words, there was this regular record of God bringing down mighty rulers who rejected him and exalting humble God-fears who worshipped him. And for that reason, she praises him. She also praises him for the opposite truth. And this is number 12, which is that he exalts the humble. Look at the last half of verse 52. It says it that way. He, and has, he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. And not only had Mary, by the way, experienced this personally, look back at verse 48. He has looked upon the humble state of his slave. She called herself a slave. She was humble. But the exaltation of the humble is a key theme throughout those Old Testament scriptures that Mary was much familiar with. Like Proverbs 3, 34. It says, though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the humble. Or Proverbs 18, 12 says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, prideful, but humility goes before glory. And of course, the familiar words to many of us of Micah 6, 8 says, What does God require of you but to do justice, to love compassion, and to walk humbly with your God? Going to verse 53, the next thing Mary prays God for, and this is number 13, is that he is the sustainer of life. The sustainer of life. Look at the first half of this verse, which comes from Psalm 107, verse 9. It says, he has filled the hungry with good things. I don't think this needs to be hyper-spiritualized or romanticized or allegorized. Rather, when we consider this in its context, she is simply here, Mary is, repeating another Old Testament truth with which we, she was familiar, which is that God is the sustainer of life. And as the sustainer of life, he has promised to and does fill the hungry with good things. Hannah said something similar in 1 Samuel 2, 5. She said, those who were, were full hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry ceased to hunger. David said in Psalm 34, 10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who inquire of Yahweh, the, the humble God-fearer, shall not be in want of any good thing. Now, of course, there are instances where the scriptures refer to spiritual hunger and, and spiritual feeding. Think of the book of Amos. In Amos chapter 8, he speaks of this famine in the land. 
And there he's not talking about physical famine, he's talking about spiritual famine. He even says this, Amos 8.11, it's not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of Yahweh. We think of the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.6, where he commends those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But here in Mary's context, as she ran through this familiar catalog of, of Old Testament scripture, she's referring to God's provision for righteous souls who were experiencing physical hunger. Just as God clothes the lilies of the field, he, he feeds the hungry, he satisfies their thirst, he provides for their most basic needs as he has always done. Here's the next one, number 14, which we find at the end of verse 53. This is our next heading. He emphasizes the eternal. He emphasizes the eternal. Look at the next few words there where it says, God has sent away the rich empty-handed. Now note the buildup there from where we've been to where that verse gives us some truth. God brings down rulers. He exalts the lowly and, and, and the humble. He, he fills the hungry with good things, and now it says he sends away the rich. One might take that whole section and be tempted to think that the Magnificat really is about social justice, and Mary might have been a Marxist, right? Wrong. That's, that's not the point here. We don't need to go back on the quotes that I read at the beginning and, and, and show where they're right. They're, they're wrong. That's not what's being said here. All that's being said here, rather, is a, a truth that any true worshiper of God has to recognize. It's an eternal truth that, that those who are rich and privileged in this world, they're ultimately going to gain nothing eternally simply by, by being rich in this world. Uh, it's true of the Old Testament. There are passages that, that Mary might have had in mind. Uh, one of them is Jeremiah 17, 11. I'm sure uh, many of us have not really spent much time in our devotions on this one, but it says, uh, Jeremiah 17, 11, as a partridge that hatches eggs which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly. In the midst of his days it will forsake him, and in the end he will be a wicked fool. In other words, don't trust in, in this context, ill-gotten earthly gains as what's going to get you right with God. Uh, to borrow another expression from the book of Jeremiah, it's all an empty cistern. It's a, it's a barrel without a bottom. You throw things in and they all pour out. The whole idea, though, is that if anybody thinks they could curry favor with God with their cash, he's ultimately going to send them into the eternal fires of hell for putting their faith in the wrong thing. God is not impressed with your bucks or your gold or your line of credit. He rewards faith. He rewards faithfulness. He rewards not the rich, but he rewards the righteous. James 2.5 puts an exclamation point on that one. He says that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. God emphasizes the eternal. Here's our last point, point number 15 about God from this section of praise from Mary and it's pretty simple. He is faithful. Number 15 is he is faithful. Look at verses 54 and 55. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. We see there that verse 54, Mary first praised God for helping Israel. He has given help, it says, to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of mercy. This is a reference to the the protective care that God had always shown Israel. We know from reading the Old Testament that you just, you, you marvel when you read the Old Testament how at every turn, God protects Israel. It's almost like he set his favor on them. It's almost like they are the apple of his eye and that he has a plan and a future for them. But over and over in the past, God repeatedly took sides with Israel against its enemies. That's what's meant here by he has given help to Israel, his servant in remembrance of his mercy. And then bringing it back full circle to the ultimate and overall reasons for her words of praise, look at verse 55. It says, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. Again, Mary knew her Bible. 
She knew the story. She was familiar with the account of God calling out Abraham or Abram at the time from Ur of the Chaldees. And, and she was familiar with his, God's formation of a nation, her nation, through that man, through Abram. She, she knew about God's great covenant promises made to Abraham. She knew about that, that marvelous promise made to Abram in Genesis 12, 3, where he says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. She knew how the story progressed then into, into Genesis 22, where, where God then said, I will greatly bless you. Now he says this to Isaac, and I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. She knew, Mary did, that, that God had honored his covenant promises in the past to Israel consistently and historically. She knew, as it says in Psalm 98, verse 3, that God has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. And she trusted that he would continue to do so, not only in her time, in her day, in the first century, but forever. Look at the last few words of her her words here, where she says, it's, he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. So when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary many verses ago what would be happening to and through her, she already had imprinted on her mind from her understanding of God's word the significance of the angel's announcement. She knew that the child that she was now carrying in her womb, the one who would be named Jesus and would save his people from their sins, not only was an answer to prayer, but a fulfilled promise. He was and he is the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.16 says that. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. And so she magnified the Lord. She magnified the Lord for his faithfulness to his people, Israel, to her, Mary, and to all who would eventually come to faith in her son. Well, so end Mary's words, verse 55, but our text ends in verse 56, which reads, and Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now recall back in verse 26, Mary arrived there in the hill country in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, meaning she stayed three more months right until the time that it was time for John the Baptist to be born. And then at that point, after her three-month stay, Mary, it says, returned to her home. She was betrothed to Joseph, but clearly from that language, we know that she wasn't yet married. She wasn't living in his house, or else it would have said his home. It says her home. And that's significant because it means that she was about to return to Nazareth, unmarried, pregnant, with an expanding waistline. She surely knew that the questions would start coming and the accusations would start flying. But faithful young woman that she was, filled with the Spirit, fluent as we've seen this morning in the promises of God's word, she was ready for whatever faced her next. Going back to all that we've learned so far from this first chapter of Luke's gospel, what we've seen so far about Mary is that she heard a word from the Lord, she believed in that word, she submitted to that word, and she rejoiced in what that word had revealed. Sometimes, I think I've said this before, we, we tend to just, because Mary is so often associated with the Roman Catholic Church, we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater and really forget about the faithful example that's modeled for us in Mary. A young woman who heard a word from the Lord, who believed in that word, who submitted that word and rejoiced in that word. May the, that be the testimony and the trajectory of each and every one of our lives here this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you for the time spent together in your word. Thank you for these words of praise that you moved Mary to say and to speak in her heart and ultimately that you caused your spirit to record in the pages of your word. Thank you that we can read these words from the lips of this young girl, this young faithful girl who certainly was privileged but ultimately demonstrated her faith over and over and over. God, we praise you for the faithful example of young Mary. God, we thank you for 
what comes as we continue on in the count of Luke's gospel, culminating in the birth of your son, the Lord Jesus. That really is where our hope lies, that he came. He came as God incarnate. He came as the perfect God-man. He died, and, and it was a perfect substitutionary sacrifice. He rose from the grave. He proved to be who he claimed to be as, as the, the, the victorious Savior of the world. And God, we know he's coming again. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. May we be found faithful in the meantime, in Jesus' name. Amen.